Good evening. This is Redwood Wonk. I'm with Dave Frank. My name is Eric Kirk. We're going to get right into it because we've got you know big news across the country. A lot of election news uh, last night. Big, huge news with uh, repercussions that will carry us into next year's elections, I think, being made a bigger deal than it will ultimately play out to be. And uh, then for the second half of the show, we're going to talk about redistricting again, I think, being played out to be a bigger deal than it will be. Uh, but we'll see what Dave thinks. But we're going to get right into the election. Biggest news being Terry McAuliffe uh, against both of our uh, predictions uh, lost. Um, uh, pretty close, but it shouldn't have been that close. Terry McAuliffe, in my opinion, partly lost because he's a boring centrist technocrat. They keep choosing these people. His whole campaign was basically that um, you know his opponent was was connected to Trump. He had really no vision uh, to, that he presented because he had no vision because he's a boring centrist technocrat. I mean, you know, he, he didn't say what he was going to do to help the middle class, the, the suburban people, and he lost the middle class that Biden had won, the suburban uh, women in particular. Um, and uh, so, and he, of course, the critical race theory was a big issue, even though it's not taught in Virginia schools. Um, in fact, it's really not taught anywhere in K through 12 schools. It really just isn't. It's the boogeyman that uh, Republicans are hoping to use in next year's schools. If the Democrats don't clarify their messaging, it will be used again. I think it's actually overrated, though, because it worked in Virginia, but it did not. And it worked in a few other places locally, but actually it got defeated uh, as a weapon in uh, school board elections and other places in the country. I'll talk a little bit about that later. But it certainly worked in Virginia, as well as a few other things, because McAuliffe, as well as other things in a debate, made the comment that became a sound bite, and yes, it was taken out of context, that parents should not be allowed to tell schools what they should teach. Now, it was a very specific bill he was referring to that would have essentially given parents uh, almost as individuals veto power over, you know, because a couple of parents don't want their kids reading certain books, it would have given them veto power over what the whole class reads in response to, the, you know, some parent that didn't like the fact that their kid had a nightmare reading Toni Morrison's Beloved, and it's it's a whole um, you know, cluster F that that's like a decade old, and and uh, McAuliffe, being a seasoned politician and and some falling out of characteristic of at least what should be the strength of a boring centrist technocrat, said it wrong, and it became the millibite that his opponent just hammered him with night after night after night, and um and he began he lost ground and the polls changed and he he fell behind in a couple of them and it was dead even and finally it, it turned out um that uh, the Republicans sensed blood they turned out um his opponent Youngkin kept a, a discipline sort of towed a great line uh, that we'll see if other Republicans are able to tow the line as deftly as he did supporting Trump, but not supporting Trump. We'll see if in the future Trump can maintain the discipline and restrain himself. He actually went to Virginia, but was real careful about what he said and stayed out of it. Um, and so he got, so he managed to get the Trump Trumpers to vote for him, the never Trumpers to vote for him, and the independents to vote for him. I also think a big factor is that Biden looks weak right now uh, because he these two bills have not gone through. Last week he finally came through, tried to show leadership um, to you know get 17.5 billion dollar and build back better through. Progressives finally said whatever, uh, gave up almost everything that they'd won and said whatever, let's get the thing passed, fine. But then Cinema and Mansion said, no, we're still not committing to it. And so everybody's sitting around waiting for them to do whatever it is they're going to do. They're not committing to anything, so it didn't get passed, so they didn't get that boost. 
Biden looks weak. He's not considered the leader of the party because he does not have sway over those two. They're just holding out for whatever. And, uh, you know, we'll talk a little bit about that, but everything's on hold because of them. And I, and quite frankly, if I was to put a single cause outside of McAuliffe's being an ineffective can, uh, campaigner and a not, not such a good candidate, um, I would put it squarely on cinema and mansion. Um, Dave? There is a, you know, there's a whole country's worth of things to talk about and, and, and there's folks talking you know, multiple sides of, of what the ultimate outcome is. So, so for, for a minute, I'll just look a focus on Virginia. I think there's a lot of uh, that we could call out of Virginia, and sure. and so the, we're talking about a place where there, you know, I guess uh, 13 out of the last 14 statewide elections have gone Democratic, and Biden had won by over 10 percent last year over Trump head to head, um, and and so so that it's, it's ripe for um, for Democratic success. McAuliffe is was an imperfect uh, candidate to say the least. He's a former governor. He had some gaffes. He's a consummate party insider. He didn't really connect with people and give them something promising to something aspirational to turn out for. He just was kind of like a party machine guy. And and so that's kind of the backstory. But but fast forward to the loss and 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 sort of you know what we see in the exit polling which we you know we didn't have a ton of time to scrutinize yet but also what a lot of the commentators were saying um 538 did a breakout by county on a county by county basis how the turnout was back in the last election just last year versus this year and and the top you know 40 percent population centers the counties that, that comprise those uh, which is like the top six or so top do half dozen those all each of those counties had a Republican advantage um, swing by, you know, three to six points, which sounds like marginal difference. Sounds like it's not terribly um, it's not terribly uh, uh, large number of, um, you know, uh, on the face of it, you know, three to six percent doesn't sound like a lot. But but in it in a, when you're talking about that's the half the population of the state or, you know, 40 percent. Um, it's it's you know, those marginal differences matter, and so broadly speaking, um, when when this Republican swing towards the GOP on a county by county basis, um, you compound that with the turnout. So the turnout for Republicans exceeded the presidential cycle. So there was a immense enthusiasm for an off year election, um, and and so a place a place with a ten percent advantage that is completely eaten up by. Uh, enthusiasm of Republicans and lack of enthusiasm from Democrats is is ripe for you know people to speculate like is there something bigger, and and so whether part of it is you know the congressional obstructionism like you talked about uh, Mansion and Cinema or whether it's you know you know placed on the blame of the president Biden for not getting much accomplished at all in the first nine ten months of his of his presidency there there's just you know there's a lot of blame to go around. So some commentators pointed to this one phenomenon, which we could look at in more detail, but I think it's worth mentioning. I think that there's a lot there, whether it's critical race theory, whether it's, um, you know, d defund the police, whether whether it's whether it's, uh, you know, who, who knows what exactly is the core. People say it's education, but but, you know, education could be the covid response and, and just this resistance uh, to, to all sorts of institutional responses to covid. But the data speaks for itself. Biden um, had a one percent point advantage amongst all white women and he had a 20 percentage point 20 percentage point advantage over non-college educated white women in the last election last night Youngkin had a 14 point advantage and a 20 percent advantage so there was a 15 point swing among all white women and a 40 point swing among non-college educated white women. So something significant happened for there to be such a massive swing of support. And and like I said, we can talk about it. I'm going to probably do a long extended show about it. Um, sure. But but I think it people are talking about, um, you know, it has to do with education and we'll, we'll talk more about that. Well, Biden has to do something about Cinema and Mansion. He has to look strong. Now, I do think, and, and I'm going to talk about it in my predictions, I do think that there's a development where he has a potential. 
to do that. But I'm going to talk about it at the end of the show. The um, but but the um, anyway, it's 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 been hammed up, and they're blaming it on progressives and moderates. It's not. I mean, the progressives have turned around. They've stopped. They said we're giving up, and it's it's just not happening. They need something to happen. The economy is stalled, and uh, because of that, and they need to to change that narrative. They've got to change the narrative, and. Yes, the the pandemic has to end, um, you know. And uh, you know, any anyway, ways so we'll talk about that. But the um, but at any rate, I want to report New Jersey was also close, and um, and it, a lot closer than it should have been. Murphy, the Democrat incumbent, was ahead in um, by ten points as much of in the polls. It turns out he's won. He's ahead by about 19,000 vote, which is not much, you know, in a state like New Jersey. He's probably going to be ahead soon. It's it's early ballots that still have to be counted. Um, and um, and also the areas that haven't been counted are all blue areas. Um, but it, he barely is squeaking by. It'll probably go to a few percentage points by the time it's done. Uh, of course, um, Ctirelli, however you say his name, has not conceded. Um, there. Uh, going back to Virginia briefly, there was also concern that they may lose the House of Delegates, which is the lower house of that. It looks like it could end up a tie. Um, and, uh, and of course, the Democrats will st still hold on to the, to the Senate um, because they, they weren't up for election last night. So, you know, th there's only so much the Republicans can do until next fall, um, at least. And, um, but there are there. This wasn't the calamity that a lot of um, polls pundits are making it out to be. There are a number of things that have happened around some good news and some bad news for progressives in Buffalo. <clears throat> the Democratic Socialist who had won uh, in the, the primary was defeated by the same candidate, a write-in candidate, because there was no Republican to run against her um, uh, this time. And so Brown, who had been the uh, mayor, won a, on a write-in campaign. And so there will be no Democratic Socialist mayor this time around. However, in Boston, um, an Asian American woman, first non-white the person ever to be elected mayor of Boston is their a bona fide progressive. That is a big win for progressives. Um, and good news for Democrats, even though it's a small thing in New Hampshire, and this is a big deal in a year like this, um, it flipped a seat. Uh, there was a special election for a Senate seat. I don't know how things work in New Hampshire, but for some reason, this was a special election for one of the many Senate seats, and there was an incumbent in there. I, I, you know, I don't know the background behind it, but the incumbent it lost to a ch Democratic challenger, and um, and and that's a big deal because you know one of the other reasons Republicans tend to normally have advantages is that the Republicans tend to turn out in off-year elections, Democrats don't. Um, so you know that is that is one of those things. So analyzing that, we we need to take a look at that. As I said before. Uh, Democrats have actually held people off in kind of bellwether areas where there are other challenges, um, some in Florida, some in Ohio, some in Pennsylvania. But there were there were school boards that were facing challenges around critical race theory in Wisconsin, Ohio, Connecticut, I believe also Pennsylvania, where they were hit hard over critical race theory. The board members responded with information, with, with you know, not running away from it or saying dumb things like, oh, parents don't have the right to, you know, uh, criticize what, what schools do. They said critical race theory is not taught in K through 12 schools. It is taught in law schools and sometimes in college. It is a, it, it is a framework of inquiry that has nothing to do with what is taught in schools. You are in, an idiot for even bringing it up in this context. And it worked. They, they, in, in a couple of those cases, the challengers were defeated by large margins because they got the information out. That is what they need to do. It did lose one board seat in uh, Texas somewhere. I can't remember somewhere else, but it was defeated in other places. Uh, bad news uh, for some is in Colorado, a whole slate of board were replaced based on a mask mandate. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of um, a lot of hype ar ar around that. But critical race theory, if 
the messaging is clear, will not be a weapon in 2022 if the Democrats are smart, if they just use it. Anyway, uh, Dave. Um, yeah, so you mentioned some of those uh, other races and other highlights around the country um, and things that are worth mentioning. There's one There's one race that uh, w was uh, brought to the light uh, by someone at 538, and, and then I looked into it and read the local news about it. So this is a Texas special election, a special district um, that was, uh, it's a 75, per sorry, 73% uh, of the residents are Hispanic. And uh, it's a it's a district that O'Rourke, when he ran for Senate, uh, when he ran for representative, um, he won by 20 points. And last year, Biden won that district by 14 points. But um, they just they, they a lot of money poured in there, and the and the person who was running as a as a uh, Republican basically was saying, look, law and order, you know, like like not not in an old school way, but just as a we really need to. He, he's a former sheriff's deputy and he's a former firefighter and he was pro business and and he ended up winning. And it's it, it it's a place where, you know, he overcame very uh, long odds. And so it's used. It's highlighted as an example of of how people need to be uh, particularly Democrats and, and and progressives need to be careful about just uh, Assuming that race is the is is a, a, a bellwether of how people vote or how people perceive political events, and that in fact, um, it really, you know, you need to be use nuanced language when you talk about things like defund the police or mm -hmm. take, you know, other things. So just so th so that's one example. And you you mentioned critical race theory, and and I think it's important to just highlight. I, I'm gonna like I said, I'm gonna do a whole show about it soon, um, but but. It's worth mentioning, like what, that, there was a concerted national effort. This guy named Christopher Rufo, he's a conservative journalist and activist. Um, this is a quote from him. Um, he said, um, "Critical race theory." He's speaking about. He says, "It's all negative to most middle class Americans, including racial minorities who see the world as creative rather than critical, individual rather than racial, and practical rather than theoretical." Strung together, the phrase "critical race theory" is hostile, academic, divisive, race obsessed, poisonous, elitist, and anti-American. So, so it's that whole dog whistle. Uh, mentality of calling out, being able to speak out about things um, that you're not actually talking about. So, so by saying, "Hey, we don't want our children, you know, indoctrinated," uh, that that's what former Governor Gilmore was saying in in uh, Virginia, you know, to help to help uh, defeat McAuliffe. He was basically saying that, like, um, the, uh, his exact. He's saying that people who speak about this are injecting. The tone, uh, uh, the, it's the tone of injecting race, a trendy philosophy of oppression, which is a radical approach and the wrong direction for Virginia schools. And so I'm, I'm bringing this to light because um, this ed these educational concerns are something that I think people need to be aware of around the country because it's going to be a playbook. It's going to be a plan and a strategy and a go to yeah. targeting and manipulating people um, because of the resentments of COVID and, and, um, but there and also cultural discomfort surrounding the fact that their kids might be ready to talk about race in the post George Floyd era, but the parents are not. And um, and and so while critical race theory may have nothing to do with what's happening in the schools, it it it's it harmonically, you know, it, it the vibrations in the universe get plucked just by insinuating that that's that that's a you know when it's brought up in the political context. Yeah, I no, I, I agree with that, and they do. You know, it, it, it need, there needs to be a discussion about it. But once you've got a catchphrase like that, um, you know, it, it's going to be hard to beat. You first have to defeat the catchphrase, and then once you do, you can you can get through to that. But it is now the catchphrase. Ninety nine percent of the people who use it don't know what it means. Even a lot of advocates, by the way, even a lot of people say, "Yeah, we need to have it in the schools." They don't know what it means. I mean, I, I, it's amazing how many people that I talk to about it. They say, oh, yeah, I want to be able to teach about slavery. No, it's not teaching about slavery. Right. That's not, you know, it's just not, that's not what it, what it is. So anyway, it's just uh, about that. I want to discuss a couple more things before we uh, move on to the next segment. One is 
question one in Maine. It's big news. Biden was uh, in Scotland this week talking about at, at the climate um, meeting uh, that we you know know about the of the G20, and uh, he didn't have a whole lot to bring because we didn't get to pa pass big uh, build back better. But you know he did actually get to be part of an agreement. But you know among other things, we've got a lot of of fighting uh, front resistance from the um, fossil fuel industry. And we saw it right there. The the uh, there's a project that's supposed to hook up um, hydroelectricity from Quebec down to Massachusetts, and they have you know the electricity going through was going to go through Maine, and they had an initiative that supposedly is going to defeat that, mostly fueled supposedly on ecological reasons, um, and um, defeated. Um, anyway, uh, it, that it will go through Vermont. It's going to be a lot more expensive, but this is the power of the fossil fuel industry and convinced people to do it based on ecological reasons, NIMBY. Anyway, we'll talk more about that. Uh, so anyways, that's uh, there's plenty more to talk about in this election. Don't have enough time in the hour. We're going to go to the next, next session. We are living in a society where the very, very rich are getting phenomenally richer. Meanwhile, the working class of this country is struggling. You got 600,000 people who are homeless. You got parents who cannot afford childcare. The game is to shrink the cost, start a whole lot of programs, and claim, look, this is just one more round of the kind of inflationary policies that they enacted earlier this year on a party line basis. They dumped almost $2 trillion on the economy, sent inflation through the roof, and they're not through. They want to keep on doing it with higher taxes and entitlement programs. So I'm here today to talk about what's fundamentally at stake right now for the families and for our country. For most of the 20th century, we led the world by a significant margin because we invested in our people. We invested in ourselves, not only in our roads and our highways and our bridges, but in our people and our families. All right. Well, we've got a lot to talk about. Um, as we're talking about 2022, we've got uh, a lot of news about redistricting, gerrymandering, and the rest. And uh, we've got some visuals to, to assist us. We've got a number of states where the maps are coming in, the final maps. And, and I, put, I, I say final in quotes because there are lawsuits about, I think, just about almost all of these maps um, being challenged on the basis of discrimination and, and whether or not the maps are being uh, passed within the criteria of the law. And I want to start with Arkansas. Um, Arkansas is uh, not a state where there should be a whole lot of argument because really, even if the Democrats were in charge of it and could gerrymander, it would be actually be very difficult for them to try to even get a, a Democratic majority district out of it. Uh, there are four districts in it. And uh, and for those of you who can, uh, who are not listening on the radio, um, there are four districts basically, and one of them uh, on the old map, as you can see, was pink rather than red because it's crowded around Little Rock, which is a, a Democratic city, and it ha has, you know, uh, I think a couple hundred thousand people in it. It's more liberal than not. It's not like San Francisco or Seattle or anything like that, which is, you know, very liberal. But you know, I think about sixty percent uh, Democrat, thirty percent Republican, um, and. And, um, and, you know, they, so it's going to tend to be, um, you know, a little bit less red than the others. Well, the Republicans f felt that um, a 13% uh, uh, Republican lean or 13 point Republican lean, whatever the criterion was, was a little too close. So they've redone it so that it's 17 points. So and when you get to the new map, it's solid beat red. Well, uh, some of the Democrats there and, and, and some of the NAACP and others are suing saying that that is disenfranchising the black vote. Um, and maybe it is, but I don't think it's going to make any difference in the long run, But because Arkansas is just, at least for today, a very red state. Dave? 
Um, yeah, so Eric, I thought I thought that Arkansas was really interesting um, for folks that either don't know or we, you know, they missed our last time we talked about this. When you say red, that means it's like a 15 point advantage or more to the Republican right. incumbent. And pink is like it's only five. And then there's gray, which is neutral. And then obviously light blue and dark blue goes the other direction. Arkansas is a very Republican state, but it's got a population of Democrat leaning voters um, in around Little Rock. So what I think is really interesting about this this map and, and how it evolved is number one, that the governor decided not to sign it and endorse it because what they did was they took that middle district and they, they, they cut three L chunks out of the area around Little Rock and portioned it off into solid Republican, you know, districts that go all the way to the far borders of the state, the other three districts, not Little Rock. Right. And, um, and so he, as the, as the governor, his perspective was like, well, I could either sign it veto veto it or just ignore it so he ignored it and it passed without his signature and his position was like well truthfully it's um you know it's probably not it's probably uh, very people will criticize that we divided up little rock to dilute the vote of the area where most of the you know many folks are minorities um and, and the population is is trending towards you know leaning democratic so so that's why you said there'll probably be lawsuits i figure that that's a real clear-cut case of you know maybe the lawsuit will be successful because it's that's what they did they divided up the minorities and spread the population and democratic leaning voters intentionally but if, even if they win, it's not going to make a difference. It's going to be for Republicans no matter what. So here we have, you know, they're going to gerrymander, but it's going to be the same result. All right. The next uh, state I'd like to take a look at is I or Colorado. Pardon me. Colorado is one of those states that grew in population and uh, actually has picked up a, um, uh, a, a district. And um, it's also one of those states that can't gerrymander because the process is run by an independent commission, uh, kind of like California. And what the independent commission has done is it has put together um, a, uh, a brand new district that is wide open. It is pretty even, but maybe slightly. I think they give it a, a Republican a rating of, of three leaning towards it, but pretty even. Um, so it could go either way. Um, and I think uh, Democrats were hoping that it would be a little bit more in their favor. But, you know, we'll, we'll see. And it basically runs from the suburbs of Denver, northern suburbs of Denver, to the southern exurbs of, um, of oh, oh, God, what is the town up north? Um, Fort Collins. Fort Collins, thank you, um, and uh, and and takes into the some of the rural areas um, of eastern uh, Colorado, and um, yep, that's the new district. Uh, we'll see who's there. There's no incumbent that lives in there, um, and then basically they have a new district that's light blue that takes some of the red areas to the southwest of Denver and merges it with what appears to be some of the western suburbs of Denver and what I. I believe to be Boulder. I can't tell from that map, but I think Boulder is just a little bit southwest, north uh, west of uh, Denver. And so I think at least part of Boulder is in there. Then the rest of the districts aren't really that changed. I mean, they look different if you look at the old map and, and the front district, but it looks like all the incumbents are pretty well safe. Um, and uh, not much change there, just, uh, you know, one, one party or the other is going to to gain a seat and that could probably go back and forth into perpetuity. Dave? Yeah, I think this is a great example of how it's supposed to work is that the commission gets together and they think about what's most fair for the state. They've got communities of interest and um, they added a new seat because of the population gain. And it turns out that that kind of leaves it with um, you know, three strongly and Democrats control all the levers of power, by the way. Mm -hmm. So, so they, they, um, they made it so that there's three solid Democrat seats, one leaning, two solid Republican seats, one leaning, and then that that eighth new one is very competitive. It doesn't lean in any direction at all. So, so it seems like it could very well be an evenly split delegation, which I think is a fair outcome, all things being equal. The one piece of uh, you know, uh, of note, so to speak, for Colorado that people are pointing to is that um, the, the, you know, Latino population there is uh, uh, a quarter of the state's population, but they don't have representation. There's no district where there's any kind of majority there. Only the new district is about 35 percent um, uh, Latino. So um, there's there's a, you know, a, a potential 
complaint that uh, that the that a quarter of the population doesn't have representation. But I think that that could ultimately um, play out in that new district where they, they see representation. And 35 percent is a significant block. They could yes. influence that. So we'll see. And traditionally, that benefits the Democrats. We'll see if that's a, a you know factor there. But however, we'll talk about that when we get to Texas. Not necessarily. All right. Uh, well, that takes us to Iowa. Um, now, Iowa is a state that has gone steadily from from light blue to red over the past two decades. Um, you know, it, it went to Gore in 2000. Um, I believe Obama took it, but it has been going red. It really went red in 2016 for, for Trump, and he took it solidly in 2020. They have four districts. Um, and um, the um, and, and the northeast district, I believe, is is the um, I think the fourth district is the most is beet red. It's the reddest of the red. Um, and the least red is the third district, which is the one that has Des Moines. And um, the and Symphony Axne, if I say it right, actually won that district. It has has held that. Um, even though it's a slightly Republican lean, about two points leaning in the Republican, but it's pretty even. It's pretty competitive. Um, and in, in Iowa, they they can gerrymander to some degree, but in, in Iowa rules, they can't split Des Moines. So they're stuck with it. And Des Moines is really the only county that she's won. And all the other counties are not that populated, so there's only so much they can do. They did alter it a bit because up in the second district, which is in the northeast, where um, Ashley and I can't read my writing, but she was in a very close race last time, almost lost it. Um, is she uh, is a Republican, only lost by three points. They decided they wanted to shore her up, so they wanted to give her some of the uh, other district there, and they and so in order to make it work, they had to move some of uh, of, of the. Um, other um, some of the votes up from um, the uh, third district uh, from Western Iowa up, and um, and they have to be real careful because if they go to the first district, that one is also competitive. They can't. They don't want to mess that up. Um, and, uh, and, and because that's also competitive, so they got to be real careful. Um, and um, and they haven't really made under this proposal. They haven't really made the Des Moines um, one any less competitive. They're they're really just coping to um, hammer uh, and and get her out just you know because of a red wave. Um, but they you know they they could still. They it potentially um, lose the the other one too, but the one uh, up in the northwest corner, Ashley, and I, again I'm forgetting the name at this point, um, is um, is now uh, pinkish, if as you can see in the new map, rather than um, competitive. There used to be three competitive districts, so that's uh, their benefit. I don't I I haven't seen if there are any lawsuits being proposed on that. I don't see that there are any um, you know ethnic minority issues that are, are being pushed with that. But that's basically all the Republicans could do to benefit is to make it a little bit more secure for that one candidate. Dave? Yeah, I mean, the, this one is pretty straightforward. Everything that you said, I, I agree with and, and I think is, is explains it pretty clearly. Um, the the takeaway that I have here uh, is that there wasn't any, like you said, no no mischief, no legal claims, no complaints, that there's a consensus uh, working to have uh, three competitive seats, two highly competitive seats and one that leans Republican and then one that's solid Republican. So so really what they did was they took a solid district and made it more solid and and everybody else is uh, has a, f a fair opportunity to compete for for uh, those seats, which I think is kind of how it should be. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's really not bad. And like I said, is right now it's three Republicans and one Democrat goes back and forth between Republican Democrat that'll possibly consider uh, continue and uh, Ashley Hinson. Oh boy, my handwriting is bad. Ashley Hinson is in power now. It went from um, an R4 to an R6, so that's not even that big of a of a difference. She could still lose, you know. And then yeah. the, in Iowa's first, it went from R R5 
to an R4. So they're putting her in a little bit of jeopardy. And Cindy Axney is R2 to R2, but up in R4, it went from R27, you know, to R29 to R27. That person's not in danger. That's all they could do. And uh, and the rest. And, um, you know, but if you look at Cindy Axney, she won Des Moines and lost in every other county. But Des Moines is the big city, so of Iowa. So that's uh, that's that's about Iowa. So all right, uh, that takes us um, to uh, we've got two big states to discuss now, and the next one is Illinois. Um, Illinois Democrats aren't messing around. Ten years ago. Democrats had an opportunity. They do not have a neutral, you know, um, uh, committee doing it. They can gerrymander. Ten years ago, they had an opportunity to gerrymander, and the majority said, "We can't do that. That's what the Republicans do. We don't want to sink to the level of of Republicans. We'll tweak it a little bit so that we can get at least one Latino majority representation." And so that one looks kind of weird. But other than that, we're not going to play those Republican games this time. No, we we don't care. They we you know the uh, the so you've got districts. It's, we're we're going to do what they did in Alabama, Utah, Texas, Ohio, and the rest. Uh, it's, it's a, so because they've got the super majority in the Republicans, if they're going to do it, we're going to do it. And if you take a look, compare the old map uh, to the proposed map for those of you who can look. And if those of you who don't are listening on the radio, I urge you to go to 538 and look at the maps uh, through their, um, their, they've got a whole page dedicated to redistricting. Yeah, it looks as ridiculous as the duck district and the snake mm -hmm. of the lake or the things that you know, you'll know you see in Texas. I mean, you, you've got uh, a, a snake that goes through and grabs Springfield to create a, a light blue but still a solidly blue new district that doesn't have an incumbent at this point it's a, in, a new district in in the middle um you've got uh, uh sherry bustos had, who was in a uh, pinkish uh, republican leaning uh district in the old map uh the illinois 17th um had had um accomplished an, an amazing upset of a republican there they're shoring her up it, it's a competitive uh district but a partisan lean dean four um so um so you know they, they they're shoring her up it, it looks it is competitive but look at that district it's it looks ridiculous and even more ridiculous is the one that is in between it and all of that blue mass of the uh, Chicago suburbs um, there which is now combines the uh, homes of Adam Kinzinger the anti-trumper who is now retiring because of this partly and Darren LaHood who's basically a trumper and very far to the right he will probably win that thing but look if you have a chance to look at it I don't even know how to describe it it's ridiculous um but and then if you look to the south at the 15th it wraps all the way around the snake like thing um <laughs> you know and uh and but as I said and there'll probably be lawsuits but um, you know, what can the Supreme Court do? They can't overturn this one and not overturn the octopus of Alabama or the tendrils going into Salt Lake City in Utah or the duck district and the snake in Ohio and, and splitting up um, Cincinnati, um, you know, or the, for that matter, the, what the Democrats have done in Maryland. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it is, this is gerrymandering and the de Democrats will pick up two uh two two new excuse me two new seats and um and the uh and will shore up the upset win um that they had with sherry bustos in illinois uh 17th um i got more to say but dave i'm gonna let you break in here so interestingly in illinois i mean again you covered it com very comprehensively um what the things that stood out to me uh, were that, and I think you mentioned this, but just for clarity's sake, uh, Illinois lost the seat because of population decline. So they went from 18 to 17. And it mm -hmm. used to be that Democrats controlled 13 out of the 18 seats, but now they've combined two Republican 
for basically the amount for Republican districts into two. So they're mm -hmm. put, pitting those people head to head. I think one is uh, was against Trump, like you said, Kins Kinsinger. And so he's going to not run and his seat's going to basically disappear. And in the other, um, the candidate, I think his name is Davis. He is uh, going to run for governor because his district, again, when you have a, a, a stronger pro-Trump person in the neighboring Republican district that's merging with yours, you either fight uh, from the middle or leave. And so that's- Let me, that's let me correct you, Dave. Davis yeah. Is, is he's actually alone. It's the Illinois 12th. The bottom has oh, you're Mike, right, you're right. Mike Boast and Mary Miller are going to yeah. have to run against each other if they either one. Oh, that's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so who knows what's going to happen there? So D Davis's yeah. situation is a different one. I apologize. Um, but yeah, point is that there's four districts kind of merging into two. So they're going to lose two seats, meaning that Demo big picture Democrats are, are probably going to have the advantage or, or will have the advantage in 14 out of 17 seats. And with, uh, you know, Governor uh, Pritzker as a Democrat, he's going to sign it um so it's it's going to happen and this is this is kind of the 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 gerrymandering uh poster child of what what we hope someday that commissions will or some federal legislation will prevent from happening at least people that are progressive minded about fair representation um one last thing that so that was number one and number two is they did create a majority latino district uh, yes. district three um, so that was a big deal for the state and and it's uh, they're sort of leading by example and saying you know we're not just going to pay lip service to a group that represents such a large percentage of our population we're going to actually empower people give them a seat at the table representation in, in congress and i think that that's admirable that is an admirable element of this plan it will also protect it from a voters right voter voting rights act challenge I mean, yes. you know, the, that's that's the main challenge that could defeat any yeah. of these things because the court yeah. has already ruled you can't challenge it on a political basis, right? And so, they, and and it it depends on state law as to whether or not they have to be communities of interest and 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 shapes. Uh, in Illinois, they don't even have to be contiguous. You can have separate islands in Illinois. Um, I don't know if they did that this time around, but um, but they, you know, and and if you look at it. Um, you know, they've uh, pretty much most of the blue hangs around Chicago and extends out of it. Um, Springfield, I, I assume Springfield must be kind of a liberal place, but obviously they're looking for liberal communities in the rural areas. I don't know what makes them liberal. You know, there might be whether or not they're like hippie colonies or, or <laughs> you know, uh, or whatever. But it's uh, but something about them obviously gives them a, a seven a, a plus, Democratic lean seven advantage there um, with however they've done it. But, you know, they craft it this way and I do I blame the Democrats I mean you know at, at this point there's there's no movement whatsoever I mean the the John Lewis bill would put an end to this but it would put an yeah. end to it everywhere where so you know it's uh, it and and the John Lewis bill once again today was not allowed to even go to debate um so our, our Republicans will scream about it but that is absolute hypocrisy. Uh, I, this is ridiculous. It, it saddens me that this is happening. But, you know, it's happening in about 15 states that are run by Republicans. This is the second state that it's happening for Democrats. Maybe it's going to happen in New York. I don't know. Um, you know, but that's, you know, that's about it. So, uh, you know, suck it up or let's agree to a national change. It'd be, make me happy. Yeah. So. Uh, I mean, uh, and like I said, yeah, it, it'll lead to a, a couple more um, things like that. But I, I, yeah, it, it is sad that it's the state of affairs. But right now you've got, I think it's something like 30, no, pardon me, 38 or 42 percent of the population with, you know, with roughly equal representation um, in Congress. That, that's just unconscionable. Right. I mean, yeah. it, ju it just doesn't work even worse than the Senate. But, you know, that's that's structured that way. Anyway, anything else to say about Illinois before we get to the. Um, no, but I was just going to ask you about your shift. Um, so we were talking about states, how they gerrymander and how they're able to get um, majority uh, of their opposition into an, an ever increasingly small, ever decreasing number of districts. But but you, you then said something larger, which is like. We have 50% of the representatives approximately in the Senate coming from a population of a much smaller population. So, so I was going to ask you, um, even in the House too, you, did you intentionally 
project that we we maybe shouldn't have um, the current breakout. I, I'm sorry to put you on the spot like this, but I'm sorry. Say what? So you're saying like we have, you know, say it. it when I was like 18 years old, I figured this out that at some point in time, there's going to be 90% of the population living in 10% of the states. And that right. that's, that makes the Senate inherently undemocratic. Oh, I think the Senate has been inherently undemocratic yeah. from the beginning. So, but we're talking about these congressional districts. We're really talking about the House. So, so I was wondering right. if you, if you made a shift from the, the small, the state, state perspective, and then projected that out to the whole body of 435 or whatever. Did, did, I, uh, did, I, did, I, hear, did I hear you right? I don't think that there's any way you could do it. I just don't think they should be allowed to gerrymander so that Alabama, for instance, has, you know, one third of its population population crammed into one uh, one one out of seven districts yeah i mean you know one one third of his is voting it's not one third of the population but it's you know right. they've got the rest spread out so that so that when half of the population half of the democrats vote it's it, it still would only be what they would still only win in one district they, they, they're spread out throughout i mean it's not yeah. the districts any that much bigger but if you were to look at at these districts um uh, you would still find Fine. It, like in Texas, as we'll get to next, the yes, blue Texas. districts. Yeah, the blue di di districts are all bigger. There's a maximum difference. You've got a range that the the districts can be. Uh, you know, from here to here. Let's say there's a difference of however many thousand. I don't know what they are. And you've got a maximum range to a minimum range, and you'll find that the Democratic, the blue uh, counties or the blue districts are at the maximum, and the red ones are all at the minimum to stuff as many Democrats in as possible. So anyway, we got to get to Texas because we only have five minutes left. Um, and Eric, before you go, I just want to say thank you because it, so you have all this really insightful stuff in your head and, and I just want to make sure you explain your thought process because that was really important for people. So thank you for doing that. You bet. Um, all right, so we're looking at Texas and boy, it looks like Texas is all red, but it, what, what you don't realize is that it's actually a lot more ev closer to even, not even, but closer to even because a lot of the districts are really tiny on that map. If you look, you'll see there's blue around Dallas, Houston, if, you can, if you're not on the radio, you, but even if you're not, you, you can know that there are a lot of districts uh, right around Dallas, Houston, Austin, San Antonio, um, and, and then you'll see some blue districts towards the south um, where there's heavy Latino representation down uh, towards the bottom of, of Texas near the border. Um, the, Texas, the Republicans who control the redistricting in this took a very interesting position. And if you take a look at the old map, uh, you'll find that there were a bunch of competitive districts, about five or six of them, and they are all around Dallas, Houston, and Austin. Um, and actually a couple next to San Antonio too. There are about five or six of them. And rather than try to take a chance at maybe increasing the number of Republicans by doing a Utah thing and sending tendrils into those areas, they decided that they don't want to take any chances because the urban areas around those and suburban areas have grown uh, with more progressives in those areas. They decided to retreat. So if you switch over to the new map, you'll see that it's blue, solid blue in those areas and solid red in the exurbs uh, because they don't want to lose those seats and the incumbents don't want to um, de definitely do not want to be running in competitive districts, especially like Chip Roy in the 21st district, which is uh, in between um, San Antonio and Austin, uh, wanted his seat to be safe. And the one semi-competitive district that's left is Tony Gonzalez. Gonzalez, um, who is in a, a Latino majority district, uh, currently um, about 70 percent Latino. I believe they've moved more white people in and more Latino people out, uh, taking in the suburbs of El Paso, which is more white, and uh, and sending more Latino people into Henry Henry Queller's uh, district, Texas 28th, um, and um, and making that more safe. 
Ironically, they created one in their uh, they they gained two seats districts, um, and they've created a safe Democratic seat as well as a safe Republican seat. And you'll notice real quickly that um, in the Texas 15th has been created in between or that goes from Austin down to the border. Um, nobody knows how it's going to work out. It's dead even. I mean, like even as far as how they rate it. Uh, there are no known politicians that live there. Um, it, it is anybody's guess as to which way it'll go. And so the ironically, the net result could be is that the Democrats actually pick up one. They could happen that way next year. But the Republicans have locked in, uh, you know, somewhere approximately two thirds majority for the next decade. If this happens, um, I'm going to let you say the rest, but there is a lawsuit pending because even though there's big increase in the relative population of Latinos, uh, there was no increase in their representation. And one black district was merged in two black districts were merged into one. So there may be actually a successful voter uh, voting um, uh, act, voters rights act. Um, uh, challenge to this that may actually even survive this Supreme Court. Dave, I'm going to give you the rest of the time. Um, well, I might not need all the time, but uh, okay. so thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, we did cover Texas once before, and uh, and and so one of the things that we talked about is, like you said, they pick up those two extra seats. I maybe I do need all the time. Uh, they do, they do pick up two extra seats, um, and and the the strategy here was instead of having about eight. Um, solid Democratic states and six or so that were up for grabs. They gave the Democrats, you know, closer to like 12 or so that were solid. But in return, there's 24 solid Republican seats. So they locked in their lead. And and that's been in effect, like you said, when you look at the map, it's very telling. They've isolated the cities. They've created one new uncertain district. And other than that, um, they've just it taken their advantage plus one and locked down 90 percent of those districts in perpetuity, or, or at least as far as the eye can see. All right, and, that, and that's true. Now, this the interesting one is going to be Texas 23rd. That's one that had traditionally has gone back and forth. They moved it from a Republican leaning five to a Republican leaning 13. That one may be challenged because they have moved Latinos out and white people in. Um, and um, and you know the, the, it, it's one that's in flux, and they basically you know did it um, by moving. They've split an army base in, in half. I mean, it's it, that one is controversial. But again, the Voters' Rights Act that was left intact, even by the Supreme Court majority nearly a decade ago, that part was left intact. You're not supposed to split that community of interest. So. Anyway, we'll see how that goes, and that could mess the whole thing up. So, all right, that takes us to the last segment. Okay, predictions, Dave. Um, I my prediction this week, uh, just referencing the fact that I thought those five percent of undecided voters in Virginia would be enough to push Terry McAuliffe over, but now that we're starting to see the analysis of what happened, and I'm he you know we're we're basically hearing that um, you know race was just so successfully deployed using uh, C CRT to to exploit differences uh, that critical race theory to exploit people's differences. Uh, I think there's going to be a, a a real focus on language in the upcoming 2022 cycle, and people are going to be, take great pains to actually articulate what they say when they mean when they when, when what they mean when they say defund the police, or articulate what they mean when they say that we ought to be discussing uh, you know. Our social studies programs should be more comprehensive than they were 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, so it, it's actually going to lead to uh, better democratic candidates and and hopefully civil discourse rather than the trench warfare that we are currently in and trending towards. Okay, I've got a similar um, actually prediction, and I'm I'm actually there's a lot of pundit doom and gloom around the uh, 2022 election. We've been discussing. I don't think gerrymandering uh, and redistricting is going to be a big issue for the Democrats in 2022, and we'll get into that even more. But so far, it's a dud for the Republicans. But I actually don't think yesterday's election results are an indication of anything other than ineffective messaging on the part. Of the Democrats. They need to get these two bills passed in whatever form. It, it looks like they probably will before 
um, Thanksgiving. And with with the children's vaccine having um, now been approved, and supposedly within days they're going to start doing that, the mandates appear to be working with all the screaming and yelling and the police protesting on the bridges and New York and all of that. They appear to be working. I think that that's going to mean an improvement in the economy. Women will be returning to the workforce. And a lot of this, the all, all of the projections of the economy, they're going to be good signs with the economy. If the economy is improving, Proving by next year, and we have some of the stuff passed, the money is being spent, and we are actually in good. I think that we have now a model, as I discussed earlier in the show, for countering this, the, C, the, the critical race theory narrative, uh, and the Democrats are on message and learned from this. You can't just attack Trump, and, you know, and, and, if, and if Trump you know, doesn't maintain his discipline, as, and I think he won't be able to, um, I think the Democrats can actually go in to the um, in, into the election year, into election season next year, in a pretty with a pretty good message, and if they have some pretty good candidates, uh, can actually do pretty well. And I actually am pretty up about it. It's really just if they're smart, um, you know, and they've got to come up with some good candidates. If they come up with a good candidate for that new district in, in Texas, for instance, and if they come up with a good candidate for that new district in Colorado, they can actually pick up some seats. And then, you know, if they can pick up a Senate seat or two, they won't depend on cinema, you know, cinema and mansion. That's the problem is they're depending on these people. Um, and, um, you know, and, and maybe something can get done. I'm being very optimistic today, <laughs> and I didn't think I would be. But, you know, but one of the real quickly, uh, Murphy almost lost. They lost a lot of ground with the legislature, but they kept their majority with the legislature. The cinemas and mansions are the ones who lost. So it's going to be more progressives. The cinemas and mansions are out of the way. There may actually be more progressive legislation as a result and, uh, you know, and give people voters something to vote for. I mean, that, you know, so so let's see what happens in New Jersey. Anyway, uh, uh, until next time, keep thinking. <laughs>